guy spends a day on the golf course with his friend who happens to be a doctor. Comes home from playing golf, and the wife says, well, how was the golf game? He said, well, I played with the doctor. How'd that go? And the guy said, well, what would you think if every time you were about to putt, somebody stuck a golf club in your ribs? And what would you think if every time you are about to hit the ball, somebody screamed in your backswing? And what would you think if every time you hit a ball in the fairway, somebody walks out and they step on top of it and press your ball down into the grass? The wife said, well, I don't think I would like it. He said, the doctor didn't either. <laughs> you didn't like that joke, did you? <laughs> it's not the best. It's not the best. But it does remind us that some people are not the easiest to get along with. We're looking at the story of a Bible character by the name of Jacob. Of Jacob. He's an Old Testament, what's called a patriarch, one of the Mount Rushmore figures in the Old Testament. And the reason we love the story of Jacob is not so much for his success, but because of his struggles. And every time a person reads the story of Jacob, they think, wow, if God could use somebody like that, he perhaps could use someone like me. So installment chapter 2 on the story of Jacob is entitled Jacob versus Shortcuts. Let's pray and then we'll get to work. Gracious Heavenly Father, oh, so full of goodness, so full of mercy. Please look with grace upon this weary and wounded world, so ravaged by a pandemic, so divided by hostility, and look with kindness upon our own lives. Have mercy, Heavenly Father, upon those of us who call ourselves your children but often behave like we're not. And especially, please forgive our speaker, for his sins are many. And help us, even through the Old Testament story of Jacob, to see today's story, the story of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus we pray. And all who agreed said, Now to understand my introduction, you're going to need to hearken back to the days before mobile phones. Yes, there was such an era. In times past, not quite so distant as the days of Noah, and not quite so recent as today's headlines, there was a segment of history known as the Days of the Landline. Please raise your hand if you can remember the Days of the Landline. Yeah, some of you are so old, somebody had to help you get your hand up. <laughs> Difficult as it may be for millennials and Gen Zers to believe, phones were not always mobile. They were not. Yeah, they did not always fit into pockets. They did not always fit into purses. Phones were not wireless. Phones were not smart. There was a day in which phones were attached to cables that attached to walls that attached to telephone lines. It's true. Ask your parents. In those days, we walked to school each day in blinding snowstorms. With no jackets to warm us, GPS to guide us, or apps to entertain us. Those were dark, dark days. <laughs> we had no cell phones. And alas, in my case, I had to use the pay phone. It was 1973. Richard Nixon was president. Watergate was brewing. And I lived in a college dormitory that was, for all practical purposes, cut off from the outside world. We were only allowed to make local calls from that telephone, that landline, in our college dorm room. So in order to speak to someone in another city, we had to use this antique tool called the payphone. Payphone. Underline the word pay. 
Yes, we had to pay to use the phone. And this would not have been a problem except for the fact that I had a crush on a sweet young lady who lived six hours away. In order for me to talk to her, I had to pay money. I know, you're looking at me, your eyes are widening to the size of quarters, and that's what I needed. Quarters, quarters, <laughs> quarters. Many quarters. I had very little money. But I had an idea, and this idea is the reason that I, I share this story. I could charge the cost of that call to someone else. Yes, the, the, the phone company allowed it. But to whom did I charge the phone calls? To my parents? Oh, no. Uh, to, to the girl who lived six hours away? She was every bit as broke as I was. No, I charged the long-distance calls to a vacuum cleaner store. I found them in a phone book. I thought, they've got plenty of money. I don't know why I thought that. Did I know the store owner? No. Did I ask his permission? No. Did I think I was doing anything dishonest? I think that's the problem. I don't think I was thinking. I think my love-fogged, underdeveloped, barely pubescent, 18-year-old brain did not know how to process and certainly did not know how to wait until I had saved enough money. I wanted to get on the phone. So I did. No, I don't know. I said to myself, I'm using a pay phone. How will anyone find out? Well, here's how. <laughs> The store owner saw the charges and he called the phone company. The phone company saw the number that I dialed and called it. They asked the sweet young thing on the other end of the line who answered if she knew anyone who might be making phone calls from a payphone on the campus of Abilene Christian University. <clears throat> Her answer, why, yes, I do. Innocently, as far as she knew, I'd won the lottery. As quick as you can say, now that was dumb. The dorm director paid me a visit. I was sent to the office of the college dean. I wrote an apology to the store owner, a check to the phone company, and some 50 years later, I'm using that story to illustrate the stupidity of shortcuts. That's what I took. I took a shortcut. Rather than take the honest, the respectable, albeit uphill, longer path, I, I took a wide, downhill, dishonest one. Now, don't you look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> you did the same. You did too. And so did every other human being other than Jesus Christ who has ever taken a breath or taken a step on God's green earth. The scripture says this, all have sinned, taken shortcuts, and fall short of the glory of God. Th th those are my parentheses. That phrase is not in the Bible, but work with me for just a moment. Isn't sin simply a shortcut? Isn't sin simply the unwillingness to trust God? The unwillingness to wait on God isn't sin simply the matter of taking things into my own hands, thinking that I can get there faster than God can. And when we sin, we take shortcuts. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. God had promised Adam and Eve that he would take care of them. They had domain over the garden. And yet, Rather than wait on the Father to fulfill His promises, they took matters into their own hands, and so they reached for the fruit. Max reached for the phone, and you 
you're thinking, do I have to answer that? Well, not out loud. But could we agree that all of us have chosen the quick and easy route on occasion? And that sin at its root is simply an unwillingness to trust, an unwillingness to wait, to follow God's plan. We take matters into our own hands. That's what Rebecca and Jacob did. Again, we're studying the life of Jacob. On the timeline, we're about 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. On the map, we're somewhere in southern Israel. And we're looking at Jacob. Uh, Jacob was the son of Isaac. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. And so he's only a couple of generations removed from the promise that God made to Abraham that through the lineage of Abraham, all of the world would be blessed. And as we turn the page to Genesis chapter, 20, chapter 27, Isaac is on his deathbed. At least he thinks he is. The truth is he was nowhere near death. He was 137 years old, but he lived to be 180. Still, here's what happened. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. Here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man, and I don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. And prepare me the kind of tasty food I like, and bring it to me so that I may give you my blessing before I die. We discussed this blessing in detail last week. It's the birthright. It's the birthright. And materially speaking, it was a big deal. It was twice the inheritance. It was a position of head over the clan. And spiritually speaking, it was super significant as well because it designated the person through whom the bloodline of the Savior would pass. Typically, this blessing or this birthright would be given to the older, to the firstborn son, Esau. And so this would no, be no problem except for the fact that God in his sovereignty had announced that he had designated it and destined it for Jacob, the second son. And he told Rebekah this, the mother he told her in a dream that the older will serve the younger. God destined Jacob to receive Isaac's blessing. So Rebekah knew this. Jacob knew this. Yet rather than wait to receive it honorably and publicly, Jacob and Rebekah took a shortcut. Rebekah spoke to her son Jacob. I just overheard your father talking with your brother Esau. He said, bring me some game and fix me a hearty meal so that I can eat and bless you with God's blessing before I die. Now, my son, listen to me. Do what I tell you. Go to the flock and get me two young goats. Pick the best. I'll prepare them into a hearty meal, the kind that your father loves. Then you'll take it to your father and he'll eat it and bless you before he dies. Jacob was nervous. When you read this text on your own, you'll see that he pushed back initially, saying something like, well, even a cataract-eyed old man can tell us apart. So Rebekah promised to take the blame. So Esau was hunting, and Rebekah and Jacob took time to cook a lamb and then cut a goatskin. Jacob put the goat skin on over his shoulders and he entered his father's tent. Jacob said to him, I am Esau. No, he wasn't. He was Jacob. But he said to his father, I am Esau, your first son. I have done what you told me. Now sit up and eat some meat of the animal that I have hunted for you and then bless me. Jacob wanted the blessing. Rebecca wanted Jacob to have the blessing. But what neither of the two were willing to do was wait on God to orchestrate the presentation of the blessing. So 
they tricked Isaac, and Isaac fell for the trick. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught smell of his clothes, he blessed him, and he said, oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. And may the sons of your mother bow down to you. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. Esau entered the tent expecting to receive the endowment, but the blessing had been given. And when Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry, Bless me, bless me too, my father. But Isaac said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me also. Bless me, my father. Now you and I see an immediate solution to this crisis, don't we? Grab deceitful Jacob by the nape of the neck and drag him back into the tent where Isaac can unbless him and rightly bless Esau. But as odd as it may sound to our Western ears, the culture simply did not permit that. Once a blessing had been given, it could not be retracted. A blessing had a built-in binding element. It was irreversible. It was irrevocable. Isaac could still give Esau a secondary blessing, but Jacob had already cashed the check. As you might imagine, this did not help the relationship between Jacob and Esau. The relationship between the twins crashed like a lawn chair in a tornado. So Esau hated Jacob. And Jacob said in his heart, I will kill my brother Jacob. Rebekah overheard Esau's anger and gave Jacob the heads up and urged him to scoot while the scooting was good. And so Jacob did. Jacob skedaddled. Rebecca and Jacob got what they wanted. But at what a cost? At what a cost? We're only a story into Jacob's story and yet tally up the damage of Jacob's life thus far. He had the blessing, but look at this. His family was splintered. He was penniless. He had no home. He was running for his life. His brother wanted to kill him, and his father had been humiliated by him. And as far as we know, he never saw his mother again. We'll press the pause button on the story. But next week when we pick this story up, you're going to see that Jacob was so broke, he had to use a rock for a pillow. But you're not going to want to miss that story. All because he took a shortcut. He could not wait. He could not wait. I wonder if we can imagine how this story might have gone otherwise had uh, Rebecca been more patient. Had she, upon receiving that message from the Lord that the older will serve the younger, what if she had gone to her husband and said, I don't understand what I heard from the Lord. But it seems to me that Jacob is to receive the blessing. And suppose the two of them then had gathered their two sons and said, we don't know exactly why, and we don't know exactly when, but we're going to trust the Lord in this, and Jacob will receive the blessing, and Esau, you'll still be blessed. You'll still be blessed. But we're just going to be obedient, and at the right time, Jacob will receive the blessing of the firstborn. And maybe today, thousands of years later, we would be reading the story of a, of a peaceful family instead of a family that had endured an eruption from whence it would never truly recover. All because they took a shortcut. 
Now, as we begin to wrap this lesson up, you know the question I'm going to ask, right? What shortcuts are you taking? Do you sense the Lord uh, prompting you to remember some times in which you're not trusting, but you're taking matters into your own hands? You know, we all take shortcuts. We cut corners. We cheat. If not the owner of the vacuum cleaner store, we cheat on our taxes. We cheat on our spouse. We deceive, not with goat skins and a lamb, but with lies or exaggerations or misstatements. We polish apples. We inflate facts. We drop names. We work the system. God wants me to have this job, we think, so we pad our resumes. God wants me to be happy, someone thinks. And I have found happiness in the arms of a woman who's not my wife. I know God wants me to tell the truth, we think, but in this case, the truth will get me into trouble. A little lie won't hurt. I wonder how many shortcuts have been justified with the best of intentions. At the sentencing for her role in the 2019 college admissions bribery scandal, actress Lori Laughlin, or Aunt Becky to all you Full House fans, she addressed the court. I made an awful decision. I went along with a plan to give my daughters an unfair advantage in the college admissions process. In doing so, I ignored my intuition and I allowed myself, look at this, to be swayed from my moral compass. I thought I was acting out of love for my children, but in reality, it only undermined and diminished my daughter's abilities and accomplishments. For the sake of our kids, we parents will do almost anything, but in the end, a a wrong shortcut, even for the right reasons, always causes somebody pain. So let's state it very clearly. There are no shortcuts with God. None. Zilch. Zero. He does not need your foot on his accelerator. He does not need my help with his plans. If God wants Jacob to receive the blessing, Jacob's going to receive the blessing. Rebecca need not connive. Jacob need not deceive. If God wants Jacob to carry and wear the mantle, it's as good as done. All that Rebecca and Jacob needed to do was this. Just wait on the Lord. Just wait on the Lord. What are you seeking? What are you wanting? What are you needing? A spouse? Well, wait on the Lord. A new job? Wait on the Lord. Are you waiting on your husband to come home, your ship to come in, your career to look up, your business to take off? If so, here's what you need to do. Just wait. Be obedient. Take the narrow road. Take the uphill path, be faithful, and be the one at work who does the work, and be the one at school who pays the price. Keep your nose clean, keep your head up, keep your knees bent, keep your eyes toward heaven. Stay focused on your heavenly Father. His timing is always right. His timing is always right. He's never been late. He's never been early. His plan is always the best, and his plan never includes deception. His plan never includes manipulation. His strategy never destroys people. His strategy never requires compromise. He never badgers. He never belittles. He never bruises. He never batters people. And if you're doing so, then you're not in the center of God's will. You may think he is slow to act, but he's not. Just trust him and wait. And pay for your own phone calls. <laughs> if you can't afford them, then don't make them. Go back to your dorm room, sit down and study. That's what that 18-year-old version of yours truly needed to hear. In fact, as things turned out, true love was not six hours away. 
True love was right there on the campus the whole time. And Deanland was just a local call <laughs> 40 years ago. Heavenly Father, now receive our prayer that, that you would direct us, that we could receive your word today. Let your Holy Spirit be strong and present as we process this story. Through Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, let's all stand. We set apart a few minutes now for, for reflection and for prayer. We have a passage that will appear on the screen behind me from Psalm 139, in which King David says, see for yourself whether I've done anything wrong and then guide me on the road to eternal life. What a prayer. And I would encourage you to to pray that prayer. Invite the Lord to, to search your heart. Be assured your heavenly Father loves you and He wants what's best for you. And His plan is the perfect plan. Also, we'd like to pray for anyone today, especially those who are sick. Or maybe your body's not holding up well in these stressful times. Or maybe your mind is not as stable as you desire. Maybe you have some fears or anxieties. Would you let us pray for you? Here's how we're going to do this today. If, if you would like to be prayed for, work your way down to the front. And this gather here uh, in front of me, and I'll offer a collective prayer. If anybody comes, or however many that come, we'll just offer one prayer at one time. So we'll take a couple of minutes now and let people have an opportunity to come forward. But go ahead, please, and enter a spirit of prayer.